Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh student. Today we're doing C2.2, which is neural signaling and IV biology. So let's get started. Okay, so there are two body systems that are used for internal communication, the endocrine system and the nervous system. So the nervous system consists of neurons. So neurons transmit nerve impulses, which are electrical signals. So we have a cytoplasm in neurons, right, with its nucleus, and then there are nerve Fibers. So uh, the longer ones are called uh, axons and the shorter ones are called dendrites. And nerve fibers are what nerve impulses travel through. So now we're going to look at the nitty gritty of how a nerve impulse actually works. What you need to know is that in the axon or in the neuron as a whole, there is a membrane potential. So membrane potential is an imbalance of net charge. So positive and negative charges between the cytoplasm and the fluid outside. So the cytoplasm is generally negative compared to the fluid outside. And so the membrane potential is normally a negative value. So when the neuron is resting, so it's not transmitting an impulse, it has a membrane potential of about minus 17 millivolts. This is an important uh, point to remember. Uh, so this is called resting potential. And it's very important for nervous impulses. So this is kept in three ways. First, through the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump, as you probably know, pumps three sodiums out and two potassiums in. So basically it pumps more positive charges outside than inside, meaning the inside stays more negative. On top of that, the membrane is just naturally more permeable to potassium. So some of the potassium that the pump brings in is going to leak out. And then thirdly, there are negatively charged proteins inside the neuron, which again contribute to this charge imbalance. Basically, we're going to have less positive charges inside than outside. I hope that's clear. So then what happens when the nerve impulse hits? So it starts with an action potential. So an action potential is a change in membrane potential. You can see here how it works. So it has two stages, first depolarization and then repolarization. So in depolarization, the membrane potential goes from resting, so minus 70, all the way up to 40, so to plus 40. And then during repolarization, it goes back to negative. So how do these changes occur in membrane potential? So it's due to the movement of positively charged ions, specifically sodium and potassium. So remember, the sodium potassium pump had brought all of the sodiums outside and the potassiums inside. So, no, so now depolarization is when sodium channels open and the sodium flows in, okay? Remember, it was outside, so now it's going to flow in through a concentration gradient, and this is facilitated diffusion. Uh, then, during repolarization, the sodium, uh, the sodium channels close, sorry, and the potassium channels open, meaning all of the potassium flows out, right? Uh, and this restores the membrane potential, so it goes back down again. However, as you can see, it goes back down more than it was initially, right? So then there's a period called the refractory period where you basically need uh, the sodium potassium pump to reestablish uh, the, the potential of minus 70, okay? So think of it as a whole, okay? During resting, the sodium potassium pumps sodium out and potassium in. Then during depolarization, the sodium comes back in. During repolarization, the potassium goes back out and then the sodium potassium pump reverses it, okay, to bring it back to normal. So these are the main stages. Okay, if that's clear, then it's important to also understand that uh, the speed of nerve impulses can vary widely. So basically, uh, some nerve fibers, some axons are myelinated. So myelin can coat the axon, it's this thing you see here in yellow, and uh, basically that just means that they are covered in these cells called Schwann cells, okay, so myelin is made of Schwann cells, but it also has these gaps, which are called nodes of Ranvier. And basically, this makes the speed of transmission of the nerve impulse much, much faster. So myelination, what you need to remember is that it increases the speed of transmission. And then on top of that, also wider axons just transmit nerve impulses faster. Good. So once the nerve impulse has gone through the neuron, it must go to another neuron, right? So a synapse is the junction between two cells in the nervous system. There are three types of synapses. So 
from a sensory cell to a neuron, right? So for example, your eye detects something, it sees something and it communicates that to a neuron, then from a neuron to another neuron, right? And then from a neuron to a muscle fiber or gland cell. And that's how you actually do things, right? Your neuron communicates to your muscle to contract and then you move or to a gland cell. So you uh, secrete hormones, right? Um, and then in the synapse, in all of these cases, there are neurotransmitters that communicate the signal between neuron and neuron. How does this work? Let's look at it. So basically, a nerve impulse is going to reach the end of this neuron, right? This is called the presynaptic neuron because it's before the synapse. So it reaches the end and this triggers calcium ions seen here to enter into the presynaptic neuron, okay? It's because these uh, channels, these calcium channels are voltage gated, meaning um, they only open when the action potential comes. Similarly to the channels that we saw before, okay, for the action potential, those are also voltage gated, the sodium and potassium channels. So the calcium is going to enter inside, okay? And that's going to cause these vesicles, which have neurotransmitter in them, to go to the membrane and fuse with it. So the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic gap by exocytosis. These neurotransmitters can then bind to receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. And that causes ion channels to open, right? Actually, some of these receptors are ion channels themselves. So then ions are going to fuse, uh, not fuse, sorry, diffuse into the postsynaptic uh, neuron through the concentration gradient, okay? And that's going to cause the membrane potential to change in the postsynaptic neuron. And if that's strong enough, it's going to trigger an action potential. Finally, neurotransmitters are then broken down and removed quickly back into the presynaptic neuron to make sure that this uh, signal doesn't go on forever. So a type of neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Uh, it's used in many, many synapses. And after it's broken, uh, after it binds, it's broken down into choline and acetate. The choline is then reabsorbed, okay? Um, and the acetate it's, is not. But then it can be reconverted back into acetylcholine. Okay, that's all for the SL um, students. For HL, I'm afraid the hardest is yet to come. So... Basically, what we didn't talk about in SL is how uh, for depolarization to happen, okay, there needs to be a trigger. So this, this doesn't just happen. There, there's a trigger. And the trigger is that membrane potential has to change to minus 55 first, okay? That's called the threshold potential, okay? So uh, why does this need to happen, okay? It's because the sodium and potassium channels, right, the ones that do facilitate a diffusion, are voltage-gated. So they need a, a potential of minus 55 or minus 50 for them to open. Now, how does this work? Okay, uh, <clears throat> to reach this threshold potential, we have these things called local currents. It basically refers to the fact that in the axon, okay, the axon is a continuum. So here we have a part that's being depolarized, okay? So let's say that uh, the neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic neuron, the, uh, the ions go in, so that makes the threshold potential be reached, okay? So this goes into depolarization. So here all the sodium is going inside, right? Whereas this part of the axon further down uh, is at resting potential, so most of its sodium is actually outside, right? Okay, what's going to happen though is there's going to be simple diffusion, okay, between the outside, right? So in, on the outside, the part that's at resting has a lot more sodium outside here in the resting, right? Whereas the part that's in action potential doesn't have as much. So sodium is going to diffuse this way. And then inside the axon, there's a lot more sodium in the part that's being depolarized because it's coming through the channel. So it's going to diffuse the other way, okay? And this is going to change the membrane potential slightly in this part that's at resting potential because it's going to lose some positive outside and gain some positive inside. And that is enough to reach this minus 50 millivolt uh, threshold potential that then causes the sodium channels to open, thus triggering an action potential. Okay, I hope this is clear. This is quite difficult to understand, I think. So any questions, please do leave them in the comments and I can clarify. Good. So more on myelination as well. Why, is my, why does myelination increase uh, velocity? You now need to understand it, okay? It's basically because at the nodes of Ranvier, these gaps, um, everything is going to clump, okay? Uh, so the idea is that all the sodium potassium pumps and all the ion channels cluster at the nodes of Ranvier, okay? Meaning um, when the action potential goes through, it's going to jump 
and that's called saltatory conduction, okay? Uh, so instead of going through the whole thing bit by bit, it's just going to jump between notes of Rainier, the action potential. So it goes much, much faster, up to a thousand times fa faster, I think. Okay, now let's look at some examples. So we need to look at the effect of neonicotinoids and cocaine. So um, they both affect the synapse, okay? So they have opposite effects. Uh, neonicotinoids are very similar to nicotine, which is in tobacco smoke. And it basically binds to the acetylcholine receptor, okay, in the central nervous system of insects. So the enzyme that normally breaks down acetylcholine does not break neonicotinoids down. So the binding is irreversible. So once they bind to the postsynaptic receptors, they don't unbind. Therefore, uh, the synapses don't work, right? So no ions go through, no action potential gets passed on. Synaptic transmission is stopped, and that paralyzes and kills the insects. So that's why neonicotinoids are used as pesticides. And they do not bind well to our acetylcholine receptors in humans, right, or mammals. So that's why they're safe. And secondly, cocaine sort of does the opposite, okay? So uh, in this case, it has to do with dopamine, right? So the neurotransmitter dopamine goes into the synaptic gap. And then dopamine is normally taken back to the presynaptic neuron through these reoptic transporters, right? Like all other neurotransmitters, it needs to leave the synapse so that it doesn't uh, bind constantly. But here, uh, cocaine blocks the reoptic transporter, meaning dopamine starts to build up in the synaptic gap, and therefore it binds to the receptor all the time. So this neuron is constantly excited, right? And that's why cocaine is a stimulant and makes you feel so good, right? It gives you feelings of euphoria because it's constantly uh, driving an action potential uh, in the dopamine pathway. Okay. Now, the next concept that you need to understand is summation, okay? So actually, not all neurotransmitters activate action potentials. Some inhibit action potentials, okay, by making the membrane potential even more negative. Um, GABA, for example, GABA, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, just so you know. Um, but how does this work in conjunction? So in reality, it's much more complicated because many, many presynaptic neurons can form a synapse with the same postsynaptic neurons, so hundreds or thousands, okay? So several, several presynaptic neurons must release neurotransmitter to trigger an action potential, and this is called summation, okay? It basically refers to how uh, the effects of inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters are combined, and the balance between all of them determines whether the action potential is initiated or not. And this is the, the basis of decision making, okay? Uh, if you have more excitatory, you're going to decide to do something. If you have more inhibitory, you're going to decide not to do it. So here you can see if there's two excitatory and one inhibitory, the action potential is likely to go through, okay? They balance out. And finally, and this is super easy, okay? So you need to know two examples of how uh, neurons might work. So for example, if a bee stings you, right? Pain receptors in the skin are going to detect it. Um, and then these receptors on sensory neuron endings are going to trigger an action potential, right? Because uh, positively charged ions are going to go in, and then that's going to go all the way to the spinal cord and the cerebral cortex where we feel pain. And then secondly, uh, consciousness. So what is consciousness? It's, it's the state of complex awareness, right? Being aware of many things at the same time. And consciousness is an emergent property of the interaction of individual neurons. So neurons individually do not have consciousness, right? But uh, we as humans do. So an emergent property, this is important to understand, arises from the interactions between the elements of a system. So that means the system is more than the sum of its parts, right? A neuron does not have consciousness, but a combination of many uh, allows for it to arise. So that's a bit of a philosophical concept almost, but I hope you get it. Okay, and let's do some questions. So this first question, uh, which of the following best describes how the resting membrane potential of a neuron is maintained? I'll pause now, you can think about it, but in three, two, and one, it's through the sodium potassium pump. Remember, okay, uh, during uh, the action potential, the sodium has gone inside, the potassium has gone outside, and now we need to restore it, so we need to switch it back to normal. So the sodium potassium pump is gonna transport three sodiums out of the cell and two potassiums into the cell. Great. Next question, uh, which of the following explains why myelinated axons conduct nerve impulses faster than unmyelinated axons? Again, pause now to think, and in three, two, and one, it's B. So the myelin sheath insulates the axon, right, those Schwann cells, and it enables action potentials to jump from one node of Ranvier to the next, because that's where all the uh, channels are going to clump, right? 
It doesn't have anything to do with neurotransmitters. Uh, it doesn't have to do with having less ion channels. That would do the opposite instead of increasing conduction speed. And uh, nodes of Ranvier are present on myelinated axons. So again, that doesn't make any sense. And the last question. During an action potential, a neuron experiences several phases, which phase is primarily associated with the rapid opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, again, three, two, and one. It's depolarization, okay? Remember, that's the first step where the sodium channels open, all the sodium goes in, and the membrane potential becomes really, really positive, right? And then uh, during depolarization, the potassium goes out, right? So it reverses what the sodium-potassium pump does, which takes sodiums out and potassiums in. Okay, I've repeated that 20 times, but I hope it's clear, okay? So this is the end of the topic. Any questions, please leave them in the comments, and I'll see you next week uh, for the next topic. Bye, everyone.